G'day everybody and welcome to another episode of the Transit Lounge podcast. My guest today is Tracy Markley. Tracy is the owner of Tracy's Personal Training. She ran the fitness studio in Huntington Beach, California for 17 years before moving and rebuilding the business in Florence, Oregon in 2013. She is a college certified trainer and continues to gain education and holds many certifications including scientific anatomy of the core and the back, biometric biomechanics specialist, hatha and sports yoga, pilates, aqua fitness and more. Tracy has recently published the book The Stroke of an Artist, The Journey of a Fitness Trainer and a Stroke Survivor, a fascinating journey of a stroke survivor who had great success in recovery. The book was written to bring hope, inspiration and encouragement to those who are in recovery and their families. Now, if you or someone you care about has had a stroke and has started their recovery, you'll know what a scary and confusing time it can be. There are all these questions going through your mind, like how long will it take to recover? Will I actually recover? What things should I avoid in case I make matters worse? My doctors and therapists were always helpful in explaining things, but obviously, because I'd never had a stroke before, I didn't know what questions to ask. And so I worried a lot and missed out on doing things that could have sped up my recovery. So if you're finding yourself in that situation, stop worrying and head to the transitloungepodcast.com where you can download a guide that will help you. It's called 7 Questions to Ask Your Doctor After a Stroke. These 7 questions are the ones I wish I had asked when I had my stroke because they not only help me better understand my condition, they help me take a more active role in my recovery rather than just waiting around to be told what to do at my next appointment. Head to the website now, the transitloungepodcast.com and download the guide. It's free. Now, just before we get started, I also wanted to let you know about some changes that are happening to the transitloungepodcast.com. We're going from the name, the transitloungepodcast.com to recoveryafterstroke.com. And you won't need to do anything. Do whatever it is that you've always done to access the website and to access the podcast because we're going to do all the work in the background to make the transition smooth and so that you don't notice the difference. Even if you continue to use the transitloungepodcast.com web address, it's still going to redirect to the new website, recoveryafterstroke.com. The other thing I wanted to let you know about is that as part of the relaunch of the Transit Lounge podcast, we are going to go to recoveryafterstroke.com and we're going to include a membership section to the website. And now this is a place where I would like to encourage everyone who's listening who's either a stroke survivor or a carer to come to so that we can create a community where people can get together, share stories, information about what helps for, uh, what helped you in your recovery or what has helped somebody else that you know that's recovering because I figure that one brain is just me doing what I do but many brains together will do a better job at sharing information and creating a space where we can all grow together and recover together share our successes and also share the difficult times and get some feedback from people that understand us and know what it is that we're going through there'll be a small membership fee of around $149 at the beginning. So I encourage you to come on board. That fee will not increase if you become a member within the first 12 months of the membership going live. And at this membership, or within this membership, I will be sharing some of the tools that I use to help me in my recovery, some courses and trainings that I've put together, and also some research that is being released that we need to be aware of so that we can adjust and make changes as research and technology improves and helps us to have a better stroke recovery. I also wanted to let you know that as part of the membership, you'll be able to access me one-on-one in an environment where I can coach you and help you overcome your recovery. I've been where you are. I have had six years in my own stroke recovery journey and I would love to help you and guide you and see you get better results and help you go from where you are to where you'd rather be. So go ahead now, come across to the transitloungepodcast.com for a little while longer if you're listening in February uh, of 2018 and subscribe to the 
email list so that when the site goes live, I can let you know and you can come across and you can check it out for yourself. Once again, thanks for listening to the Transit Lounge podcast and now it's on with the show. Tracy, good morning from Melbourne. Welcome to the program. Good morning. Well, good afternoon from my end. (laughs) Uh, We have had some interesting times trying to get together and record this interview. So I'm glad we finally got got to make it happen. Me too. I'm excited. I've been excited all day. (laughs) Uh, I've been excited for about a month since we first met and (laughs) since we uh, exchanged a couple of comments on a, a post that we were following on the internet on Facebook. And then since we tried to get together last time and we couldn't get the technology to help us out, and now here we are, we finally made it. And the reason why I'm excited is because it's very rare that I get to speak to somebody who is on the other side of stroke in the caring aspect of stroke. And you're not a carer specifically, but you're somebody who helps people uh, in their recovery. Can you give us a little bit of insight how you're involved with people recovering from stroke? Well, I've been in the fitness industry for over 20 years and all different dynamics of people I've worked with, but I've probably worked with about a couple dozen stroke patients in the last 20 years, all at different levels. And the particular survivor, Gary, who was in my book, he was such a unique case that it was just, it had to be shared because I work a lot with like the brain and the neurological parts of things, but not because I meant to, it just kind of act, it kind of just the work I did and studied kind of fell into that. And when working with this one gentleman that I did, who's in my book, we got to work together pretty much five days a week almost. And he, it was a good example of doing something every day to get, to give him the pathways a chance to come back for movement. And lots of the times when we have therapy, it's, you know, half hour, twice a week, or it's not something every day. And the fact that he was every day doing something, it was such a good example that possibly if people did more than just a therapist say, or not that, or not, I don't want to, not that therapists are bad, just more that they can do. There's a possibility they may have more recovery than than they think they're able to. Yeah, okay. does that make sense? It does make <laughs> sense because one of the things that happens when we uh, get to, out of hospital is often the doctors have set the limitations. They've said things like, um, "This is about what you can expect." They say things like, "Well, from now on, it's going to be slow and long and tedious and all those types of things." So they create these uh, negative environments that they get people to go home with. And sometimes the mindset can be really difficult. After stroke recovery, we really struggle with, during stroke recovery, we really struggle with not only all the things that are harder now, energy levels are harder, you know, the brain is not working properly, thinking is not working properly. Then we also struggle with what we've been told that we can possibly achieve. And sometimes what the doctor says is negative. So it doesn't surprise me. It's hard to find your place to put your mindset on hope like having your hope it's kind of as i see with people you don't know where to place your hope and you don't know because you have the limits in your mind and possibly some limits are true but maybe not you don't know yeah but when they when i hear them be told that they you know after years as far as you're gonna get like that's not true like i was listening to your last interview that you just uploaded Hmm. And you mentioned to the gentleman you're talking to how you get the numbness in your leg still. Gary was at almost three years post stroke and I was with him and he was standing in a BOSU ball and he said, the feeling just came back in my leg three years post stroke. Yeah. And I'm like, oh my God, I was with him when he got feeling back in his hand. So I never seen him limited like the comments that people have said. And I thought, you know, I know there's people out there probably know what I know, but being a trainer, I know the personal trainer name kind of comes cliche. Sometimes Mm. there's a vast of education that some have and some don't. And I push education a lot. I just, 
don't think I, if I limit my education, I would limit my clients. And I, so like with working with, for instance, the, my gentleman who was getting all, when he kept getting these feelings and sensations back, I'm like, this is so cool. I want people to know what he experienced. He did too. He wanted to help people, but I wanted people to know what I've experienced. Cause there's probably a people a lot smarter than me out there that might grab something that I found with him that might, go, might make them go, Oh, let's do this. That could help them even further than I know, you know, cause, does that make sense? Yeah. I just wanted to share what I've experienced because it might help somebody else click and go, oh, okay, let's go here. Yeah. Um, just so that we can create the context, you've, have you got a copy of the book there that we're going to talk about a little bit later um, and pop it up into the middle of the screen? And that's the gentleman. Yeah. Yep. That's the gentleman, Gary, that we're talking about, right? Yes. Okay. And it's a stroke of an artist, the journey of a fitness trainer and a stroke survivor. I met him six months post stroke in a walker and that's the most fragile I ever started with someone. Mm. It was a stroke survivor. Usually I meet him either the stroke didn't affect him as bad or I meet him further down the line. And yeah. so he was pretty amazing. And by the end he was walking across BOSU balls and standing in BOSU balls doing battle ropes and still getting sensations back. He still was having issues. He couldn't drive yet. But every once in a while, you go, oh, I can feel my finger. And when he, when I was with him, when he was able to feel the coldness of a water bottle, I go, what? He goes, I didn't used to feel the coldness. I'm like, oh my god. So, I he at almost three years post stroke before he went, he got sick. Um, he never stopped making games, and that's, I think, inspiring and hopeful for people. And he started walking up to other people on walkers or canes and say, you don't give up. You can do this. And I want whatever our journey was to help everybody else have hope and keep pushing through. Because on one of your talks, too, I went and listened to most of your stuff. <laughs> uh, you were talking about the positive thinking. And, and, and you, I don't remember the exact story, but you were talking about someone I think was calling their hand a name or yeah. calling yeah. this. Oh, I had a gentleman who was almost 90 who's had a stroke. I met him probably a year and a half after. And, but his stroke affected him whole differently. They're, you know, everybody's so different where it hits the brain. I think it affects them, the love and how their home is, just everything. Mm. Everything affects the, the, survive, the recovery. He would look at his hand and just call it names. And, and we'd get mad, I'm like, no, say nice things to him. <laughs> say nice things. And when you, you were talking about that when your lectures, I'm like, yeah, that's so important. It is because yeah. you're, I feel your body hears you. And I find that just as like women who want to lose weight. If they keep saying, I'm never going to lose weight, I'm never going to lose weight. Really? They don't. Yeah. Your body if hears you. Your, what happens is I, I witnessed the difference in the change. So the person that you're talking about is Ivan. Um, the person I call Ivan and Ivan was in his late seventies, somewhere there. And his hand wouldn't move. It wouldn't move the way that he wanted it to move. So he would call it a bastard. And what happens is that he doesn't realize when he's using negative terms to describe himself, the, just like when you call somebody else a bastard and that makes them feel certain things in their body, that does the same thing to him. So he didn't notice that it was changing the way that his body was responding. So it was tensing up. It was going into a stressed mode. You know, it was doing things that you would expect somebody else will do when you call them such a name. So then what happened was I just told him, um, and I didn't tell him to pay attention, but I just told him to call his hand a friend. And when he called his hand his friend, well, what's happening automatically is just like a, your friend experiences an amazing feeling when you call them your friend, so does your body when you call it your friend. And he was able to loosen up his hand without thinking about it. The tension went away. You know, the more fluidity came into the motion. And as a result, he experienced what he couldn't experience before that, which is picking up the object and putting it in a different location without knocking it over. And for him, that lesson for him was just that maybe if he is nicer to himself without giving him the whole back end, the whole spiel of, why he needs to speak better, 
him just mm-hmm. noticing the difference between one and the other was enough to get him going. And if you think of the body like your body is like a com- well, like a whole community, like your body is like a community working together. Mm. If you're hating one part of it, it's not going to work together. It's almost like you're hating something you want to work and it doesn't match up. It's like it's not in a whole loving cycle together. And I think it makes a big difference. Yeah, it makes a huge difference. This person ha- had in 30 seconds more results than he had had in you know, weeks or days. I'm not sure how long he was in the rehabilitation ward with me, but he just got massive results just in that 30 seconds and everyone was stunned. So it's really amazing. And hopefully the people around also caught on a little bit, the physiotherapists that were there, the uh, other patients. So I hope that that's what happened. So part of this podcast is to get this type of information around and to get people like you who's had the opposite side of, mm-hmm. of that to tell your story because I tell my story and it's great, but people need to hear it from very various different methods. So how does somebody come to you to say, oh, I want physical therapy? Do uh, What is it that you do? How is it that people find you? Well, normally, you know, because you only get so many physical therapy visits. And I think sometimes physical therapists are also limited in what they can do. As a trainer, we can almost get closer. You know, if we want to spend more time with you, we can. We can talk more. We can get a little more personal, I think. Uh Yeah. And being personal is, it brings out more. Like a lot of like, well, this is with all my clients, but he's an example in the book. So communicating with them and knowing like, what's numb in the leg, what's going on. Sometimes we might talk 20 minutes before we even get into things. Mm. And when therapy, you can't do that. And it's almost like I've become like the second brain when, you know, communicating. So we're on the same path. What do you mean you can feel your finger now? You couldn't feel it yesterday. Then I'm like, okay, let's go do this now. And I kind of take my clients around with the bodies guiding you. And sometimes I think in therapy, they don't, it's maybe sometimes their passion's not there or they're limited just because that's how they are limited. Um, there's a combo there. How, I have how, the, specifically, how specifically do you feel they're limited? What, what is it that limits them, do you feel? Well, like for example, um, I use the BOSU ball and the balance disc a lot because when you're on those, it helps stimulate the central nervous system, the brain and the spinal column, which I feel helps get the pathways can help connect pathways and remind me to tell you about the guy with a hand with that. I wanted to tell you that since last time. So I asked the therapist once, why don't you guys send them home with something like this? And he says, it's a liability issue. So they can't really go here, go use this balances, get home anymore. Liability. I don't have that. So we have a different and like one of his therapists started coming to one of my Saturday morning classes that Gary was in and he'd go, Oh my God, he's doing so good. And, and I would talk about the brain and the neurological system. And he came back one day and he goes, I believe every, everything you're saying, it's making sense. I see the results. He goes, it's not in my physical therapy books. So I think also now I think it depends on the mindset individually. I mean, like there's personal trainers that just do enough to get a test and then they don't do anything more studying. There may be, physical therapist is, and that's in every education, every field, but you have to keep expanding out. So if you became a therapist 10 years ago and you haven't furthered out to the new things on the brain and the neurological system and just the new studies, you may not be able to connect to a client the way it can help them. I've always been passionate about it. And if there's always more I can learn to help the people I want to know, I don't want to, I don't want to limit a client because I limited me. Yeah. I don't think it's fair. So I think that's one thing. I don't have the limits. And I get to be with them more personal. You know, when you're in phys- physical therapy, there's usually like six people around you. They're on a schedule. And I know many times with me working with people, even like people with back injuries, they come in and show me the piece of paper of exercises for back injuries where they all have the same exercises. Mm-hmm. And they all have different reasons they have their back injuries. I'm like, God, it's just, they're not a piece of paper. There's more to the people. Yeah. So getting to know my client and you guys personally, I can say, what do you mean last night you ate bad? And like you mentioned on that, on the last one that 
you notice when you eat processed foods, you have more numbness. Mm. Now, I've accepted that with a client. I haven't thought that. So now my brain's going to start watching people. So I learned from you. So, yeah. so everybody has their own personal thing they connect to, and then I work off that. Well, I, I agree. Not, I, not like cookie cutters. Yeah, I agree with you completely. So it's exactly what happened to me. And the timeline that we were on, we were booked in for an hour. So for the first, you know, X amount of time, they do this, then they do that, then they do that. But I think what the, what it did for me, this uh, situation where I had to go home and most of the time be without physical therapy because you only get three hours a week is what I got after I left. And even while I was in hospital in rehab, I only really got about three hours a day. Now, I know that that's actually quite a lot for somebody who's just recovering from a stroke because it's three hours a day is exhausting because they start... Yeah. They start off with 10 minutes a day and then they move up to 20 minutes a day and then slowly after a month in rehabilitation, you're doing maybe three hours a day. Um, so for me, what was happening is there was a lot of downtime where I felt like I could be doing more, especially when I had energy and I felt good about myself on a particular day or you know things were just going my way. Yes. And part of this message again is I feel like is like we need to take responsibility for our own healing as well so that when we're not with Tracy so that we're not in physical therapy we can you know do some things that are specific to us that mm -hmm. help us recover from our specific challenge our specific stroke or injury or whatever it is um, so I know a lot of the people listening and watching on YouTube will have gone through something similar and one of the constant complaints when people recovering from stroke is that there's just not enough therapy. There's just not yeah. enough services and I don't really enjoy it because I'm doing stuff that doesn't interest me. And that's what I love about what you do is because, you know, p people I imagine can tailor a program to their needs. Mm -hmm. And it changes because you don't always know which pathways are coming back when. So... And because he's in the book, because he was so, so connected, he can come in and say, you know, yesterday I did this. I'm like, you did? Okay, let's go to that. Let's go do this now. So so that's really cool. But not everybody's that connected. So it depends how – so you seem very in tune to yourself. So it also depends on the mindset. This is with any goal in life, how in tune you are with your own being. If you can, you know, you know when you're sad because this happened or – you know you're really tired because you didn't sleep or did you get in a fight with your wife? I mean, there's so many. If you know kind of why your body's in the state that it is, it helps. Mm. I know sometimes after a stroke, things, you don't know why things do mm. things either. But the more in tune you are, that helps me get in tune. So that we were so in tune from the day we met, it made it almost like this magical thing. And it just made us feel like this journey should help somebody somewhere. And he always has said if his story just helped one person, that one person's worth it. But I like, I was, they did a big article on me in the, a big newspaper last weekend. And I got a call from a woman who's about an hour and a half away. Her husband's 90 and had a stroke. And she said that he's very energetic and he wants to do things. He seems like he has a personality like Gary. He doesn't want to sit around. Like, like you said, he, these days he feels like I can do more. He would get up and do more. Mm. He'd go walk or something. And what she said, and I thought this was kind of interesting. She said, and like, and I'm not putting down on therapists at all. She said, the therapists just seem just so humdrum and they're just there. They're not connecting personally. And they're just like, yeah, yeah, whatever. She was, but you seem like you care. And, and, and it was very sweet how she picked, she got that. And that was nice. Mm -hmm. But I think that's the thing too. You're not going to, it's like, if you go to a counselor or a therapist, you could, you connect personally with the people you're going to kind of develop more yeah. like your friends. You open up more with friends you connect to than just a stranger in the street. Yeah. I think you're healing your body, especially at the level is after a stroke and you can barely connect to things and, and, it helps to have someone with you that connects at that level. Does that you get you get what I'm saying? I get it. Yeah. In episode ten of the podcast, I interviewed a lady called Claire who had a stroke, and she had a therapist come over who was quite um, stiff, let's just say. And um, the way that she spoke to her was not very um, endure, you know, not very um, 
not, not very likely to make you feel comfortable around this person. And um, she, the therapist told Claire, um, move your bad hand, et cetera, et cetera. And Claire had to interrupt her and say, look, I don't have a bad hand. I have a hand that's recovering. I have a hand that's getting better, but not a bad hand. So please don't use words and sentences like, I have a bad hand, um, because I don't. So that therapist was really taken aback, and she never came back. She actually asked him not to have Claire as a client anymore. Yeah, It didn't make her just say, oh, wow, let me change that. Wow. Because I know a couple times with Gary, I go, we would say that. Go, no, 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 not the bad hand. That We would switch, because it just sometimes it came out yeah. that way, but you didn't mean to. Like, no, 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 we don't mean that. Yeah. Um, can I tell you about my guy's hand? I really wanted to tell you this. Yeah, before you tell me about your guy's hand, tell me about Gary because we've spoken about him a lot. I know it's a, um, he's part of your book. So let's talk about Gary, who he was, how you met him, etc., and then uh, how, how long you worked together and some of the changes. Let's see if we can do a five-minute sort of chat about Gary. Okay. So I met Gary in November 2014. He was at six months past stroke, post-stroke. And his sister had made the call to me. And then when they came in to meet me, he was in his walker. And I remember when he was approaching me, I thought, okay, that must be Gary. And I remember my first thought was, oh, I've never worked with someone so fragile. And then I went, and then I got a little nervous at first. And I thought, no, I can do this. I, I, and we just, we connected. So I think cause we're both in tune. We, we were both connected. Plus, we're both here in the small town in Florence, Oregon, but we both came from California and towns next to each other. And he was older than me, like 20, almost 20 years older, about 17, but we went to the same college, same surf and beach spots all growing up. So we had this, a lot of familiarity that made us connect. When they were approaching me, he was with his sisters, brother-in-law and neighbor, and they were laughing. And I remember thinking, how neat he has this support group. I mean, who comes to therapy with this pack of people? I thought that was, I thought that seemed like he had a lot of love around him and they were, they laughed a lot. And I thought that was, that meant something really good too. And we just, he trusted me instantly, which was really kind because I, we were, I was showing some things at the beginning we we're talking and he just said, I go, when you're ready, you can do it. And I remember him saying, we're talking about him sitting on a ball and doing some things. He said, I don't understand how I'll be able to do that yet, but I trust you. And I mm -hmm. thought, oh, that's so neat. So that helped that we had. Because sometimes you just meet people, you have that connection. Mm -hmm. And so it took him, I think, at least three months before he remembered my name. He was an artist. He made a living on being artist. He had artworks in Colorado and the art shops here and in California artist was his whole life pretty known in the art industry for him and he couldn't read write or do his artwork anymore and he had art to still sign that he couldn't even sell until he learned to write again so he was going through all that and his wife at home would help him with things as well and I think she would have him doing things such as putting pins and bottles and he was he'd never went a day when he wasn't working on stuff mm. as soon as he could he would go on a treadmill hold on walk really slow he said that he felt it didn't make sense to sit around he's it made sense in his head the more he tried to walk the more it come back and I so I read read him some studies that like Cleveland Clinic and other study groups, you know, other hospitals and search, you know, research people have done about as soon as you can get walking on a treadmill and hold on. And so he said at home, he would get up every hour and try to walk 20 minutes or as much as he could. He did this on his own before I even mm. met him. Yeah. So he's always just doing something, which I thought was great. He wasn't a client that came in and I'd say, did you do your work? No. <laughs> so he, he worked so well with me because he was on the same page of his recovery than I was. Because sometimes you work with clients, whether it's a weight loss or whatever they're recovering from in their body, that I care more than they do. They don't do their homework, which is very important. They don't 
you know, you give them, okay, do this every day at home. I didn't do my stuff. And then you kind of, you can only take them so far. He did everything. Mm. And so he came to me three days a week for an hour a day, an hour each visit. And he would, on the other days, he would still come to the gym and he would try to do some of the stuff he could do. And I'd go check on him and talk to him. And it, he kept getting, you know, as time goes on, he got to do a little more. And uh, probably about a, almost a year, he was able to go to my Pilates class, but he would sit right next to me in the classes so I can direct him. And he got to the point, I taught 10 classes a week of different things. So he was training with me during the week in private and taking every class I taught except for yoga because I didn't think he was holding, I didn't think yoga would be good for him. But he did the Pilates, the core. He was able to, you know, walk BOSU balls. He was able to lay on the the big Swiss balls and walk out on his hands. And he was able to do things that when I, but he, you know, you know how to first or couldn't do anything. Yeah. I remember him just like dragging his hand, dragging his foot. And it got to the point where he can start doing things. It just, it was, it was fascinating to watch him just go like that. And, and he was always very positive and we would laugh a lot, but he's very connected. He wanted to learn and, but the, he'd have his times where he'd just come mm. in and say, you know, strokes suck. That's important to say, actually, yeah. Yeah, and I remember him saying that so often that one day I go, you know, we should write a book and call it Dear Stroke, You Suck and write your journey because you have a journey that's a little more outstanding than the typical client. Mm. And I'm with you five days a week. You, that's a rare thing for both of us. And, well, sometimes six days a week. And so we kind of laughed it off, but I – thought no we have to do this so we did it well I did it he couldn't read or write but but right about a month or two for the book was going to editing I was he was starting he was he's been doing his artwork again it wasn't the same he wasn't really happy with it and so I asked him what is it like now and he said that you know when he used to do his artwork he can you know I want to paint a long black line and he could now it's a thick thick short stroke and it drives him crazy I'm like Oh, a stroke of an artist. Let's change the name of the book. So mm. that's how we got the name of the book. It just kind of had two little things, but it made sense. And, but through the journey, like he came in with the brace on his leg. I always forget the name of those. They do that a lot for drop foot. Yep. And, I, and I remember the first couple of weeks and he was showing me his brace. And I said, you know, I don't get how the body, wherever we build what the leg needs to do down there with that on there. Mm. It, so I go, can I see what you move like without it? And he he didn't want that thing. He would told he was told he'd have it the rest of his life. Well, I think within the first couple of weeks with him, it's gone. He just stopped wearing it. He would wear it there, take it off. And I was able to help him get his foot drop and everything coming back in. But with that on, you can't. And not that I'm telling me they should take that off. But because we worked with him from his center, I believe people – your body goes to the center. I mean, like, wait, let me rephrase that. Working from the inside of the body out. Mm-hmm. So my studies are the brain sends a message to the parts of the center of the body to stabilize before movement. So you have, and that's in the book too, you have the multifidus, the transverse muscle, and the pelvic floor. They're on the same neurological loop. The multifidus is a muscle all down the spine. You know, the little ones goes all the way down. And... That's the main stabilizer of the spine. And a lot of studies says that muscle gets the message before anything else to stabilize the body, you're going to move. So I always start with almost all my clients making sure that system is programming. But in my head, if your body's programmed to send messages places and it gets to the center of the body and this isn't programming, it makes sense to me. It's going to take longer for new pathways to get to the limbs because it's a system and it's kind of breaking down in the middle. Yeah. So, and working with him, he was such an extreme case and we would see things. He got the feeling back in his hand that made me really start reaching out to people who are, you know, way smarter than me in the industry and ask Mm. them questions. Mm. Why do you think this happened? And they would, so I'm not afraid to ask because if I don't know something, I'm not going to pretend I do because that's not fair. Yeah. I was so, going to yeah. say, I was going to say like, what's interesting is that he was, 
And if I, if I go back, I remember about the, the story about Ivan and about how he was talking about his hand. Is that I wonder, do you feel like he would have had a better result if he just embraced the difference in his art? Because he was still an artist and perhaps he wasn't able to make fine lines anymore or for the time being. But do you think he would have had a better outcome or a better result or felt better about himself if he worked on the mindset to embrace the new version of his art? He was really trying. He was really working on that. And and his other artwork looked good. It just didn't look like he was used to doing. Right. So he was still trying to make peace with the changes. And then when the idea of fitness, they, they're like education, they have an idea journal. They did an article on us for in his recovery success. And when that article came out, he almost just his focus wasn't so much art. All he wanted to do is his have, have his story finished in the book so he can help people. And he just wanted to, so was out, his journey just changed. He wanted to do art, but trying to find peace with his new art became not so important to him anymore. So it was kind of, kind of cool. Yeah. It neat. And some people didn't understand that, but he did. I understood it because he knows how hard it is to come back from a stroke and how frustrating it is to try to make your body work like it used to and mm. thinking and forgetting when you're talking and all those things that come with it is so frustrating. And some people don't get that. So I know a couple people would say, well, why does all he do is talk about that? I'm like, well, his whole world got taken away from him. And his goal right now is to recover. And that's his life. It's like, it's his new passion now, recover. People talk about their passion and he can't drive anymore, mm -hmm. you know, and usually, you know, you can just get up in a car and take off and drive and do, you know, that's a big thing to lose. Yeah, massive. Do you, do you get to drive now? Oh, I get to drive, yeah. Um, okay. I wasn't allowed to drive for the first six months um, after the first bleed, and that was six years ago. Um, actually, February is the six-year anniversary of the first bleed that I uh, experienced. Um so no driving for six months, then I got the driving back and after my surgery in November 2014, I didn't drive for three months. Uh, so that was quite a interesting time, relying on other people to pick you up or you know, trying to get onto public transport with your balance being an issue and all those types of things. It was scary at times and, and also I don't look like I've had any neurological problems. So when I get on a train, or in Melbourne, we have trams or buses. Um, it's very difficult for me to say to somebody, I really need to sit down in that chair that's been set aside for um, yeah. the disabled passengers because they'll look at you and they'll go, well, you don't look like there's anything wrong, mate. You know, So it's a bit of a, uh, a lot of people experience the whole invisible disability where we're challenged by certain things, but you can't tell, so you don't. So you assume that there's nothing wrong with you. You look just like anyone else. So it gives you a bit of an insight into mental health challenges that people face. Yes. Um, so I'm back driving now, and I've got to say that getting the ability back to drive has was probably one of the biggest things. You know, just not needing to ring people and rely on people and all that was a big deal for me. Oh, it's um, a big deal, yeah. You know, so I I hope that people still uh, not driving after their stroke. Uh, the, the, I hope that they're finding a way to overcome it or get through it or be okay with the fact that they can't drive. But for me, I didn't get a chance to find new ways to do things because I had everyone just coming around and picking me up and dropping me off and taking me places. And in hindsight, the distances, the times that, the amount of time that I wasn't allowed to drive wasn't that long. It was only six months. And it was at the very, it was at the time when I was very unwell. Uh, so I think the independence thing was more related to how unwell I was rather than uh, the ability not to drive. So by that, I mean that it was related to am I always going to be this unwell where I won't be able to drive? It was kind of that that was playing on my mind more than I really want to go somewhere today and I can't go because I can't drive. It was more I want to go somewhere and I can't go because I don't feel 
well. I'm not. I'm yeah. not doing well. You know, yeah. so it's a very different thing. So the two. And, you know, and in your head, you also don't know well, how long am I not going to feel well. You. I mean, there's a lot of dynamics that goes on. And that's exhausting. Yeah, Did because you feel peripheral vision loss. No, I didn't have any vision loss. I didn't have any hearing challenges, anything like that. Um, I just, but I didn't. But distance was a bit of an issue. Judging distances, I didn't really grasp the concept of how far things were away from me. I didn't know it at the time, um, but what I remember now is that I used to walk through doorways and knock into the door or knock into the door frame or, and I didn't understand why that was happening, but it was because of my, I wasn't able to really properly judge just distance from me and well, from things. Well, you lose your spatial awareness of what's in your space. Yeah. That, that's interesting. It was, I remember... In the book, if I'm not interrupting you, um, I remember, well, not in the book, in the, it, with Gary, I remember him just out of the blue one day, just, just stopping in the gym and saying, you know, I know there's cars over there driving. I know people are here, but I don't feel them. And I'm like, oh my God, he just described aware, spatial awareness and proprioception. And he doesn't even know about this stuff. Yeah. I'm like, God, this guy's so connected. And then I was with him when the day when he got, he got, he was standing on the balancing disc doing things and he goes, I got to tell you something. He gets off and he goes, it's like my world used to stop here and now it's here. And I went, oh my God, he got it back. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was just, it was like magical, but those you have to, you have to work on getting that stuff back to it. And sometimes it comes back. Sometimes you have to work. It's just, everybody's different. Some people's things just come back. Yeah. And some people have to work hard on it by being focused and doing things. And I don't think you always know which one you are. You just have to keep trying things, if that makes sense. And yeah. you just don't know because yeah. the stroke is so different. Yeah, you have to be curious. You have to be curious about, oh, what if I try this and what if I try that? And, and then you'll discover things that you didn't know before you tried it. So I, see, mm -hmm. I think that's what got me to where I am. Curiosity, you know, constantly learning, learning from others, researching what I could, when I could. And, you know, six years down um, the track, like I'm... I have a lot of information. I'm, I'm about to sh start sharing that in a membership section of this particular podcast. So the website will change names from the Transit Lounge podcast to recoveryafterstroke.com. And recoveryafterstroke.com will be the podcast, which is something that people can just listen to like you did. And then there'll be a membership section where people can come to, sign up for a year and run through some courses that I've put together and also get coached one on one by me. That's so nice. So what's really important is what your your client Gary was saying is that we need to now share this information with other people. There's no point in me knowing all these things about what helped me and keeping it to myself. What's the point of that? Yeah. Cuz there may be one thing that you like like when you mentioned earlier in that other um in your other interview about how you connected to the fact that you got more numbness in your numbness, you felt more numb the day after you had processed food. I'm like, wow, now that saying that, I'm pretty sure in the next year I'm gonna have a client and that's gonna help them. That's just how it is when you learn little things. Yeah, all little <laughs> things on that help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, do me a favor, can you tell me how the book came to be? So you guys decided that you were going to write a book or, or put a book out, but you actually wrote it, which you know, a lot of people say, let's write a book. I'm going to write a book. What well, I was keeping it? records of his um, ah. just amazing moments. And um, I might sneeze. Excuse me if I do. Um, and I would just, I was just so in awe about the stuff with him. And one of the times, so we were talking, I was telling him, I'm going to write this. And I don't, you know, I think he believed me, did it. Cause like you said, people say things. So I was keeping notes and I actually kept notes in a, like a, just a construction paper book of colors. And I would go to this page and write this. And when he did something, I, so I had like a treadmill page. I think I just thrown all over. It wasn't, it was organized in a sense, I guess. And then the one day I just sat down, okay, it's time to put it in writing on the computer. And I didn't know what I was doing. How do you write a book? I don't know. So I just kept writing. Then as things were coming together, I'd meet someone that's written a book before, or one thing that was just, everything about this journey was just crazy cool. So I wanted to put a chapter on muscles in there. I wanted to put a chapter on knowledge, at least what I know of knowledge, because 
I know with me, if I understand why I'm doing things, it would make more sense to me. Plus, I hoped anyone who's a trainer in the fitness industry who doesn't know a lot about things of strokes, it might help them help somebody better. Because I don't, like I said earlier, I don't think it's fair to pretend you know something when you don't. Or I think it's very proper for a trainer to say, you know what, the trainer over there is more experienced in this. You should see them. They can help you more. Mm -hmm. I just think that's so much better. It's kinder and it's fair than to fake it. So I wanted to put whatever I knew out there so it can help whoever too. So, um, so I couldn't draw muscles. So one day I'm at the gym and this lady comes in and I'm talking to her and I'm showing her some things. And she, I said, you know, you really understand the muscles. Were you a nurse? And she goes, oh, no, I I did anatomy and illustrations for nursing manuals for 25 years. Why do you need my services? I need to volunteer my time. I'm like, what? Are you kidding me? And then I told her about the book. She goes, I'll help you. I'm like, seriously? So she did. I told her what I wanted. She she did, you know, some of the things I wanted and and. Yeah. And that, and then, and, you know, Gary being an artist, I told him the next day and he's like, Oh my God, do you know how hard it is to find an artist even does that kind of stuff? But then she walks into this gym and this small town to you yeah. and offers. So I know this book is just meant to be. So everything was just saying, don't stop this project. And then as we, you know, when he got sick, um, Gary it was right time when Gary got sick. Yeah, he got sick. He was doing really good. In fact, about a week, it was about two weeks before he had to go in the hospital. That's when the numbness was coming back in his leg. He got all, I mean, the feeling was coming back in his leg. And the interesting thing too is his balance got a little off again. It's like his brain had to learn how to rebalance with feeling in the leg. Yes, absolutely. It was, yeah, it was readjusting. And I'm like, and every, like every unique little detail I could see it. He can feel it. That's what made it so cool. And we wanted this story shared because I don't think everybody gets that opportunity. Mm -hmm. And it helped me know what to do next. Because I remember he was just a little out of balance. I'm like, I, you know, I think it's because your leg is feeling it and you have to balance with feeling it now. You couldn't feel it for any because you're right. And we would, I mean, he actually got to the point where we'd be doing stuff and he would come in, you know, I'm feeling kind of off today. I go, you know, it really seems like before you have a big gain, you feel off for a couple of days and all of a sudden you have a change. He goes, I think you're right. So it started to be the point he'd come into the gym and he'd go, I think something else is going to change. I feel a little off. And it would. I mean, that's how in tune he was. And then our connection and being in tune with it was really cool. So anyway, so the book just kept going and he made me promise no matter what to finish it. I'm like, I am. I am. But it, it was hard. You know, and at one point we thought maybe don't use his name. And so I had it called, we changed his name to something different in the book. Then I would change it back. And then, you know, then when he called me one day and said, you know, I won't make it to class today. You know, I couldn't breathe last night. So I need a, he needed to go in for valve replacement. And, um, so he was in the hospital maybe six or seven days before he had the surgery. We were talking every day and, he was just like, let's get this over with. Let's make this the last chapter in the book, my heart surgery and recovery, and we'll move from there. And then he had the surgery. It went well. They went back in. He had a massive heart attack, which sometimes they say that's common, but something happened and it went into more complications in his colon and it just ended up being sick. After six weeks in ICU, he passed. And that was just last May. And it was very hard. So we have three people trying to edit the book, me and these two other girls, and we're trying not to cry because we're editing and grieving. And, and you know, so I think it turned out pretty good for all it went through. <laughs> this book went through a lot to get out. And, yeah. Yeah, so. I understand. Like, it's amazing. <laughs> it's amazing, firstly, that you're connected with your clients. really heartwarming to see uh, a physical therapist who has – this type of connection but then you know somebody who's a personal trainer who's not really in that state uh mm -hmm. of play you know normally it's really heartwarming as well to see that you've had this connection with this person it's yeah. great to see that you're able to now tell the story about the results that you noticed the difference the before and the after in your client who became your friend who became your co-author um 
and it's really important that these messages get out there because there's a lot of people that are going through a tough time. And I think the more and more I share these stories and interview people, the more I'm thinking about the carers. And Mm -hmm. you're not necessarily a carer, but the people that you're supporting the most who you may not realize you're also supporting is the carer. Because if you get, you know, that person back home better than what they were when they started, then that carer gets more relief. They get their life back. They get less stress. Yeah, because if you can go down the street and start walking without a cane, now your partner, yeah, it just it changes the whole dynamics of your whole life. Yeah, so and not only was, not only do ahead. you get me back on track and me feeling great about myself, you're affecting so many other people in the community, in the family, in my circle, just like that as well. You're doing more than just recovering the health of one person. Yeah. Which is kind of neat, and I and I know that, but hearing you say it, it's like, oh yeah, I forget that part. <laughs> I mean, you do, but sometimes you kind of feel it in your heart. And it's like, oh, that's kind of cool. Well, you know, but when I was when the book was ready to come out, um, which was November, I was just it just out of the blue, it just hit me. I sat down, and I started crying, and I thought, oh my God, if I would have limited my education, I would have limited his result and he would have always thought it was the stroke Hmm. and it wouldn't have been the stroke it would have been the person the trainer he was with didn't want to learn anymore and thought that was good enough and he would have spent the rest of his life just okay this is my life I had a stroke I'll never get that off my leg and I thought wow that's so profound and it made me so sad and it made me more even more want just to get out and go, come on, you trainers, get more educated or even therapists learn, you know, just reach out more because these people are trying so hard to get better. And if you give them no hope or limit them, they're not even going to know it's not them. I mean, they're not even going to know it was that person helping them. They're going to think, oh, yeah, I had a stroke. This is all I can do or or whatever they're recovering from. It's, it's They don't know they're limited by outside sur- outside people yeah influences yeah absolutely yeah they're gonna think it's just an illness and that's not even the case sometimes maybe yeah. sometimes yes but not not in his case it wouldn't have been yeah as a coach as well somebody who coaches people to overcome you know life challenges or whatever it is and you do you get that you get that insight into understanding what it was that perhaps made them feel like uh well i can't do that and sometimes it stems back to many many years prior to you know the time that I get to spend with them in the coaching environment and you get to hear them say things like you know uh, you know I'm never going to be able to play footy or any of that sort of stuff or soccer or whatever and when when you ask them why that is is because it maybe it was something that somebody said to them when they were 12 mm-hmm. that somehow for some reason that stuck in their head and they just repeated that and played that tape over and over and over again and just convinced themselves that they couldn't do it you know and then the challenge with that is say that person becomes a physical therapist and uses their their idea of whether or not football can or cannot be played under these circumstances if they use their idea and project that idea onto their patient yes then they're causing harm they are causing harm and they are limiting themselves because not only have they stopped themselves from playing a sport that they may have loved, but they're stopping somebody else from getting to that point. And it's yes. exactly what you're saying. And there needs yeah. to be a lot of self-awareness into how we speak, what we say, not only to ourselves, obviously to our clients. And if a, a physical therapist is not encouraging, and if a physical therapist is drawing on their own personal inadequate feelings about what's possible, then they're not going to be supporting somebody. They're just going to be making matters worse. And I know one time I, when I first moved here to Oregon, somebody ran, drove into my car and I had to wear a little brace on my hand and I had to go to the physical therapist. And first he was 45 minutes late. And then he told me that I had an MRI and it said I had a pole ligament and he got, and I was working with gymnastics and I like doing handstands still. And he said, oh, well, you're too old. You shouldn't be doing handstands anyway. You don't have a, he said, you don't have a torn ligament. It's age. And I went, 
oh my God, I saw an orthopedic. It's a, and so I, I complained about it, I never went back, but just my experience, I knew better. But if you get somebody like that and you don't know better and you, it, it, it can change the whole world. So people like that shouldn't be therapists. It's not fair. I don't yeah. know why they're there. They're not honoring, helping people. I, I don't know why they're there. Yeah. <laughs> sense to me. I agree. You're supposed to care. <laughs> yeah, I completely agree. Well, I'm glad that you do. I'm glad that you got to write the book. Can you, for uh, as we wrap up, can you let people know where they can get a copy of your book? Can you hold it up to the middle of the screen one more time? For the people listening on iTunes... Um, can you, I share? <laughs> that's perfect. For the people listening, there'll be a copy of the book, uh, the photo, on the, on the um, website. So you'll be able to go to the website and check it out. Click the link and find where you can get it. Um, but Tracy, where can people uh, find a copy of the book? You, you can get it at my website if you want one signed. I can send it to you. And it's tracyspersonaltraining.com. No E in my name. T-R-A-C-Y, the letter S, personaltraining.com. It's also on Amazon. And it's in paperback and Kindle. But this week, it also came out in Audible because I know a lot of stroke survivors can't read. So I got I got someone to put an Audible. It's finished. It's on audible.com as of right now. And sometime in the next few days, it's going to be available on Amazon and iTunes. So it's just Fabulous. in the process. For it. And it was oh, so neat wow. to hear it to me. Yeah. That, yeah. Because yeah, people can't, like Gary couldn't read. He wouldn't be able to read the book. And plus also as caregivers, wives, husbands, spouses, cousins, whoever is in your pack of people, they're too tired to read. Yeah. They're up with you. They're worried about you. So, and it's only, it's less than an hour and a half to listen to it. It's pretty quick. So we, I just thought this needs to, so we did, it was a neat little project, but um, yeah. Good Sometimes work. Sometimes you close your eyes and listen and yeah. not read. I love it. That's excellent. That's excellent. But um, I've had, People tell me when they stroke people tell me stroke people stroke survivors tell me I just keep reading the same paragraph over and over I can't process it mm. like well how is this going to help them so yeah so it's on it's getting I'm hoping by the end of the week or next week all it's available on all three things but it takes a process and yeah they send an email when it's available yeah so. and recently you wrote another book I did and it's called Tipping Towards Balance. And it's about, there's a little bit, Gary has a little part in there too, but it's about eight different chapters, little short chapters, maybe two pages each of different people that had balance issues, tripping issues, tripping and falling and different illnesses or ailments that brought them to that. And then I put in the eight, the eight exercises I use with people. I mean, I use a lot of them, but these are basic eight I always use with people with balance issues. So those are at the end. And it's because I've had several people here in town tell me that now when they go hiking and are your beautiful forest, we can hike in, they start, they trip over the roots yeah. or they're for some reason they may have the foot drop. So they they've lost the awareness and space where they step over items. So these, these things I've done with people, all these people in the book, they've gotten it back. And when was 90, he doesn't fall down anymore. I worked with ladies 105. So I have this little pieces of people in there and, Hopefully, we'll help them. Yeah, or absolutely. Also other trainers learn how to help clients better with things too. It's I have two. Definitely going to help. It is definitely, definitely going to help. Everything that you've said just to me is all the things that I wish that I could have learned and done early on uh, without the, all the research and all the trying to find all the different solutions and answers and trying to find all the different people. I think what's great about it is that if I take my book now and I need a physical therapist, if I take that book, my copy of it, and I just hand it to her and say, look, read this. This is what I need. If you can help me out you know, in these areas, that would be great. I need you to take this particular approach. It's a another amazing tool in the toolbox of stroke recovery. I thank you very much yeah. for thinking thank of doing you. it. I thank you very much for doing it and putting the effort in and making it available on audiobook. That's even better. That is just the most amazing thing because it's exactly what you said. When I was trying to get my ability to read back, I would just go over one paragraph forever, forever, and just over and over. And it's not that I didn't, I, I, it, would, it wasn't a complicated book, it was just that I couldn't process in my head what that paragraph was saying. I couldn't remember 
what I started, you know, 10 lines back. So I had to go back and keep reading it. Um, and I've heard so many people tell me that. Yeah. And it's part of the learning process, but um, it's also challenging, especially when you just want to get good, get through a good read or, a, you know, a good book. Yeah. It's frustrating. And then you're, and you're also, I know in people's heads when that stuff's going on, it's like, is this ever going to come back? And you know, it's not like you're being negative, but it is. Yeah. But you do think, was well, this how it's always going to be? Is it going to come back? Even though you, people may call that negative thinking, but it's really not. It's kind of natural wonders, yeah. too. So I think that happens, too. I think we get into the negative thinking when it's not negative thinking, and it mixes people up in their own process yeah. of thoughts that are natural to have. Yeah. And I think that limits people, too, because they're battling with not being negative when they're really being positive, and the whole negative positive thing, I think, messes with people's heads because mm. sometimes you're going to have a doubt because it is natural. Yeah. You know, it's like, well, how long is this going to last? Will I be like that next year? Will I have another stroke? I mean, I think those things are normal to have and we're, and it, it's just another stress to put on you <laughs> to yep. judge thought. Do you know what I mean? I do. Absolutely. Look, it was lovely to get to know you for about an hour. I look forward to keeping in touch and learning about the successes that you have Please feel free to drop me a line anytime. I would love to know what, what it is that you're up to. And if there's anything I can do to help out, just please let me know. And I know several people I know are going to start watching your YouTube too because I've been telling people. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Tracy. I loved hearing you. So, Pardon? Thank you. I loved hearing you on your videos when I went and looked you up. Like, oh, these are great. Yeah. I get to be part of it. How exciting. Yeah. Well, that's, thank, that's, you. thank you so much for saying that. It does... It is what I can do to give back and to start sharing what I know and what other people know. What's the point of us holding on to that and not telling anyone about it? And you were funny too. I'm like, and he's funny too. <laughs> <laughs> I try and be sometimes. Um, I say dad jokes to my kids. They don't think I'm funny. <laughs> <laughs> they will someday. <laughs> yeah, I doubt it. Well, thanks again, Tracy. We'll talk soon. Okay, thank you. Have a good day. You too.